So this comes with Windows 10 Home. What the luck, come on. Let's get rid of that Windows Home. Let's get some Windows Pro. Copy and paste my code from the description. You can also get Office 2019. Just paste my code, woof. It's Windows Pro time. MacBook Pro 16, i7 versus i9 versus 53000 versus 5500 versus GTX 1650 XPS 15 versus 15 inch MacBook Pro. Oh, I do not recommend you benchmark Four laptops, it's just absolutely nuts. I appreciate a lot because it's a lot of benchmarking. You're going to know everything from content creation, Lightroom, Photoshop, Premiere, Final Cut, 3D applications, gaming, of course, there will be gaming. Now, at the end of this video, you're going to see this thing is an absolute monster maintaining over 60 watts during the whole Cinebench test and it dipped slightly just when the fan curve was kicking in. And I mean up to 68 watts nearly sometimes during this test like more than any other laptop i've had now when it comes to this macbook pro 16 i really do suggest you watch the whole video and i'm not trying to bury the lead or anything there's some points here that need discussing i'm going to get into the benchmark quickly first because some of those things may be deal breakers and you know i'm just thinking from my perspective i would want to know these things or you can just buy it and learn the hard way it's up to you anyway let's get into it before i get onto gaming let's do some content creation and stuff like that now, when it comes to the specs of the model, look on screen. Basically, I have a decked out i9 with 64 gigs RAM, 8 gigabytes RX 5500 graphics on a MacBook Pro 16. I also have another MacBook Pro 16 with an i7 and a base graphics, the RX 5300 and XPS 15 with an i7 1650. There are some i9 benchmarks in here as well. And of course, the MacBook Pro 15 with the i9 and Vega 20 graphics. So it'll be interesting to see what comes out on top here, obviously, you probably already know, but let's just have a look at the GPU difference between a 5300 and 8 gigabyte RX 5500 in the MacBook Pro 16. So if you have a look here on the left, this is Luxmark, Luxball, and you can see there is a difference there, 11,313 versus 10,644. Obviously the i9 MacBook Pro 16 is on the left, so there's a bit of a difference there. My i7 MacBook Pro would get a score of around 2,400 for Cinebench. Have a look at this, 3,555 on the i9 and the 16 inch MacBook Pro. This is the 2.4 gigahertz and I'll show you a run of Cinebench later. You, you're not going to believe the wattage that this can sustain compared to the i7, which I've pretty much got a dud with that one. On the left, the RX 5500 is, you know, 100 points or a bit more than 100 points faster than the RX 5300. Doesn't seem that much. You'll be interested in seeing the game in later. Now let's have a look at Photoshop. In the middle is the MacBook Pro 16 with the i9 and RX 5500 graphics. You can see there much higher score, obviously 947 versus 728 on the XPS 15. That's an i7. And on the i7 MacBook Pro 16 inch, it's 756. So the XPS 15 i7 and i7 MacBook Pro, very similar. We just have a look at the GPU scores. You can see almost identical on the GPU score. But if you have a look at that Monster i9 with that eight gigabytes of graphics, look at the GPU score 81 versus basically 70 on the other one. So an extra 10 points for the GPU. Also, you have an i9 with eight cores. So yeah, it's going to be faster. And this is nearly as fast as like a desktop. I'm talking a Hackintosh I'm just messing about with with a 9900K 5 gigahertz Radeon 7. This is nearly the same score in Photoshop. So amazing performance in Photoshop. Again, on the left is the i9 RX 5500. On the right is the i7 RX 5300. I will put up the XPS 15 score in a sec, which will sort of blow your mind a little bit. And it has nothing to do with how much more powerful the graphics card is. As you can see here on the left, obviously the RX 5500 with eight gigabytes of video memory is doing better. It's a faster graphics card as well. It's got 24 compute units versus 20 compute units on the 5300. So yeah, it's faster. Take a screenshot, you can have a look. But when I go to the XPS 15, now this is where things get interesting. You have the score of the XPS 15 on the right with the GTX 1650. If you don't know what spec view perf is, Basically 3D applications tested like, like 3D Studio Max, Maya, Cartier, stuff like that. So 3D apps. And what you can see on the left there, the scores, 
the RX 5500 is just killing it, except for 3D Studio Max, where the 1650 is faster. Now, it isn't all down to graphics card here. This is all to do with you get the pro drivers with the Radeon graphics cards when you're in Windows, okay? So you get the blue drivers, not the red ones, not the gaming drivers, you get the professional drivers. That's what's making the biggest difference here. I mean, if you have a look at SNX03, which is down the bottom, it's like 15X. There's a lot of things here that are 2X. So if you're definitely into 3D and stuff like that, you can boot camp into this and it's just going to be amazing performance because you get the pro drivers. Now on the XPS 15, you can use studio drivers. It makes no difference really. That was the studio driver. But to really compare, you need to get a you know a Quadro graphics card with Quadro drivers or anything with Quadro drivers. Then you're comparing apples to apples. The drivers make a hell of a difference there. Now let's go to Puget System Benchmark, which tests all different types of video, 30 FPS, 60 FPS, GPU heavy effects cpu heavy effects transitions all that sort of stuff playback rendering it tests all that red raw footage pro res h.264 hevc that's why i like this test it's no point just showing one benchmark from one project one render it just makes no sense this gives you an overall idea of system performance on the left of course is the i9 rx 5500 and on the right is the i7 rx 5300 you can see there of course you know 506 versus 535 Playback 61, playback 52. So obviously with the better graphics, eight gigabytes of video memory and an i9, two extra cores, you're gonna get better playback. Also get much better rendering too, 40 versus 34. But if we pull in the XPS 15, which has an i7 as well, and compare it to the MacBook Pro 16 with an i7, see the XPS 15 is better than the i7 MacBook Pro 16 in Premiere. Interestingly, the playback score is better on the MacBook Pro but the export score is much better on the XPS 15. Given that this is a comprehensive test of all those things I said, that's pretty good. In my opinion, playback is more important to me, but 49 and virtually 50 versus 52, it's not that much of a difference. Of course, the i9 MacBook Pro 16 with the 8 gigabytes RX 5500 is on another level. Of course, the i9 on the XPS 15 will be too. All right, so now let's have a look at Lightroom exporting 75 raw files to JPEGs. They all perform well inside Lightroom, you know, adjustment brushes and all that. They all kill that. We have a look here, the XPS 1599 versus MacBook Pro 1699, virtually the same. The i7, two minutes and two seconds. And with the XPS 15 i7, you get one minute 58. Now, I said that my i7 MacBook Pro 16 is a dud. You'll see later why it's a dud. Cannot even maintain 50 watts. It just gets too hot. That's like during Cinebench and stuff like that. We have a look at my famous video render test that I test all the laptops on. I've moved over to Adobe 2020 now. So all those cores below are pretty much irrelevant because they're done on a different Adobe software. It's interesting to see that if you look on the right hand side there, they are software rendering. HE is hardware encoding. Now it's interesting that Adobe 2020 is actually slower than 2019 at the moment. So thanks Adobe for making things slower, but not in the hardware encoding. So I think they've worked a lot on the hardware encoding. If you have a look there, top of the charts is the i9 MacBook Pro with the eight gigabytes, 5,500. Yeah, all right, three minutes and 38, it's pretty decent. You can see the hardware encoding, it's not that much difference because it's basically using you know, Intel Quick Sync and you know, stuff like that. So there is a difference, but it's not that much. If we go to software rendering, I mean, yeah, look at that i9, the MacBook Pro, six minutes and 44 seconds. It used to be faster, by the way compared to the XPS 15 i9, which is seven minutes and 27 seconds. I guess that's not that different, but the difference with the i7 MacBook Pro and the i7 XPS 15, there is a bit of a difference there. And that's coming up very slow. And that's using more CPU than GPU when you software encode. So I will give you my recommendations later. If I just go to Bruce X and I go to Final Cut and I have a look at these and you can see the 5,500, 11 seconds for Bruce X. I mean, this used to take 30 seconds on the iMac Pro. Um, it's, they've done a lot of work on metal. You know, two seconds might not sound like a lot, but on such a short test, it's, you know, it's a fair bit. And compared to the Vega 20 MacBook Pro 15, quite a lot faster. Even the i7, the base i7 is beating the i9 Vega 20. So, yeah, really good performance there. They've done a lot of work on metal that, you know, and you can see the benefits of the i9, not so much in this test because it's more GPU, but definitely in the graphics. 
So if you have a look at, you know, Fire Strike, you can see 8,400. You've got a graphic score of 9,444. The XPS 15, not that far behind. And you get a graphic score of 8,953. So, you know, yeah, there's a bit of a difference there. It's interesting that the base iMac, you know, graphics is more powerful than the 1650. But then if we go to, obviously, the 8 gigabyte RX 5500, and this is where I've got to stress the point that that card is capable of so much more because this is severely limited in this MacBook Pro. You'll see later, a bit of a difference there. You know, 10,000 graphics score versus 9,444, but that card is capable of more. Before I get into gaming, some of the things you need to know, there's three things I want you to know, and then I'll give my recommendation after the gaming benchmarks. First of all, the Wi-Fi is it's not great on both of these. Any of the MacBook Pros, I've upgraded to Wi-Fi 6 and it plays up, all right? plays up all the time. Never used to play up on my old Wi-Fi router, the Wi-Fi 5 one, but it was always slow. Like they use Broadcom chips and they're pretty slow. It's really disappointing that it doesn't have Wi-Fi 6. Also, when I was gaming, I was getting like power limit throttling stutters or like VRM throttling or CPU and GPU throttling. Kept on doing micro stutters. Wi-Fi was playing up and the network was playing up because it doesn't like Wi-Fi 6. So if you're ever thinking of upgrading to Wi-Fi 6, <laughs> don't do it if you got one of these MacBook Pros. And with the XPS 15 and it's, you know, Wi-Fi 6, I can transfer pretty much as fast as cable. I mean, up to 100 megabytes per second, whereas this one here is like in the 60s megabytes per second. Big difference there. Also, when you game, I don't think it's worth getting the 8 gigabyte graphics card for gaming because if you have a look at the gaming, you see it's sort of the same wattage. The CPU will stay at about 15 watts. The GPU will stay, you know, up to 50 when it can. But with the 8 gigabyte one, you're going to get more power limit throttling. I actually sent up to 52 watts that try and draw. You've got 8 gigabytes of video memory, so it's going to be hotter. If you have a look at the gaming benchmarks, yes, of course, it is faster. But when I was playing something like DSX Mankind Divided, I'll put the benchmarks up back in a sec. With the 5300, I can maintain over 60 frames per second consistently, right? But with the 5500 and 8 gigabytes of RAM and the i9, I could boost, you know, over 70 frames per second, even higher, but then it would drop down to about 45, 50 frames per second and then boost up again. Combination of things, you know, heat, power limit throttling. In actual fact, given that, you know, the 5300 pretty much plays every game, you know, 60 FPS at high settings, I wouldn't be getting the 8 gigabyte 5500 for gaming or even just the 5500 in general if you're going to be gaming and that's why you're thinking of choosing in between the two. If you're thinking gaming in mind, just get the 5300. It's good enough and then you're not going to have any of those issues that I had with the 5500. Now that was behavior only in certain games, like it was DSX Mankind Divided. I saw it a bit in Battlefield as well. Some of the games, yeah, it would be consistently faster. And when I seen the clock at 4 gigahertz peaking, like for example, Battlefield, it would do over 60 frames per second Battlefield at high settings, right? But when that CPU was able to maintain that 4 gigahertz and you were getting 50 watts out of the GPU, which it won't do for very long, I was getting in excess of 80 frames per second. So there's so much more potential in that graphics card, but gaming wise, you're not going to get the benefits of it in this MacBook Pro. These are geared for content creation. They're tuned for that. The system, you know, you're getting the pro drivers. They said they've actually tuned the graphics card to be more better for content creation sort of stuff. Definitely gaming was not even a consideration. And if you want that graphics card, have a good reason for it, right? The 8 gigabytes is going to make a difference for content creation. It's going to be better. There's no doubt about it. You've seen that in the playback scores of Premiere Pro and stuff like that. The render times are faster. I've noticed in the timeline, it just feels like butter with this eight gigabytes, like in the timeline, it's like super smooth. It's like a desktop. Now, the other thing I wanted to warn you about is if you connect a Thunderbolt 3 display or any display through the Thunderbolt, which you obviously have to do, it won't maintain its full wattage for long. It'll actually, you know, peak. It'll go up to 60 watts. You'll see this at the end. Watch the video. You'll, you'll see that it'll maintain over 60 watts, even up to 68 watts during Cinebench, the whole test. When I connected external display, I'll only do it for about maybe three quarters of the test and then it will drop down to about 50 watts. That's because the Thunderbolt 3, because you have discrete controllers for your Thunderbolt 3, that heats up the system. So this is something not many people have picked up and Ash picked this up from Vitudio. Go check Ash from Vitudio, check his channel out, check his videos out on these. He noticed that when he plugs external display, the fan comes on. All right, so that's fair enough, it gets hot. 
but I didn't know it affected the CPU performance and clearly run this benchmark every time that I had an external display connected, it would not maintain the 60 watts during Cinebench. That's just something to know about. If you're gonna have external displays, maybe pull it out when you're rendering or something like that, because you're not gonna get the full performance. And maybe if you're always connected to that, maybe you think, well, if I'm not getting the benefit of the full wattage, maybe I can go down to a lower spec CPU or something. So watch the Cinebench runs, you'll see it. I clearly explain. So in conclusion, is it worth upgrading from the last MacBook Pro with the Vega 2099? Not really. I don't think it's that much of a difference that it's, you know, really worth spending that much more money and then, you know, taking a hit on the 15 inch. I think that's going to be good for a few, you know, at least three, four, five years. And so maybe even if you can pick up one of those on a discount, why not? Certainly if you're on an older Mac, it's a no brainer. Just get the 16 inch, bigger display, better you know, high resolution, better cooling, better battery, better performance. It's just a better laptop all around. And yeah. So anyway, that was oh, that was a lot of testing. I'd like to thank you guys for watching. I'll catch you in the next one. Sally Ho. All right. So you will be able to hear the fans come on. This is not a connected to an external display. Let's see if it does the same sort of behavior. Let's look at that wattage is on the left. And boom, 86 watts. That's nice. I'll tell you when the fans come on, you'll probably be able to hear them. Still maintaining over 60 watts, just dropped under 60 watts. And now back up to 65 watts, sustained. Fans not even on yet. I mean, they are slow on, like really low. Still maintaining 66 watts. Wow. How is it not 100 degrees doing 66 watts? Now the fan has just come on right now. Okay, 67 watts, 67 watts. Wow, that's more than any PC out of the box unless you overclock and undervolt and stuff like 67 watts, 66 watts. Now the, it's gone up to 97 degrees, as you can see. Still maintaining 64 watts. This is amazing. 62 watts now that it's reached pretty much 100 degrees, but still 60 watts. Now, when I had it, like external capture, now it would drop to about 50 something watts. It's 70, 67! What? It's 95 degrees. The fans are just cranked up to like sort of max now and still maintaining 62, 67. What? It's finished. That is amazing. That is how it's supposed to work. And that's why I was so disappointed with the i7 that could not even maintain 50. All right, let's see how this big 16 inch performs when you connect it to, you know, an external monitor. And the only difference here is it's connected to an external monitor. And Ash has a big 16 inch, just like me. He's a big Israel Folau fan. If you can Google him, he's a good bloke. Um, anyway. Maintaining 60 something watts. This is after the boost clock's over. So it goes up to 80 something. And now it's like 67 watts. Amazing performance. This one is killing it. I'm really happy with this one compared to the i7 that turned my like solid state into a floppy. That one, uh, you know, I'm maintaining over only 50 watts. But you'll see what's going to happen is it's going to drop off a cliff. And the only reason is, is because it's connected to an external monitor via Thunderbolt 3. So the Thunderbolt 3 heats up. Now Ash from Vitudio, go check out his videos. He actually discovered, now it's dropping down below 50 watts, see? Uh, down to 54 watts, and now below 50 watts. You know, down to 45. That's only because that Thunderbolt 3 is connected to the display. And that's the thing, they connected it to two cinema displays or whatever they're called, the XDR ones. And it just blows. It can't handle the Thunderbolt ports being hot. Even Ash said, like, when he connects to a display, you know, the fan comes on. So that really sucks. I don't know why that is. Oh, well, I actually do know why that is. It's obviously the Thunderbolt's just getting too hot. But if you don't have it connected to, you know, a, an external monitor, it doesn't do this. It goes 60 watts the whole run. So anyway, catch you in the next one.